Is this inbound after hours still? Is this what it is under the under the umbrella? I never know what they are these days. It's like inbound at home in hours. <laughs> this is inbound in the spare room. Today we're going to be talking about um, how to talk to your prospects or your audience face to, well, without face-to-face and um, seeing as we're all stuck at home now um, you, you may be wondering what's the best approach um, everybody seems to be hammering email and other things so we wanted to have a chat today around how us as, as an agency are approaching it from a sales and marketing perspective but also a few ideas on what you can do if you don't want to be doing just uh, what you've been seeing around you so yeah, I thought it'd be a good place to start from a sales perspective. Um, Ricky, how have you been looking at prospect outreach and speaking to people in a sales capacity without a face-to-face uh, meetings being possible? Yeah, um, 80, 90% of the process is as it always has been really because we do a lot of the first, second, third stage of the sales process in on Zoom anyway, so um, having a discovery call, see whether we can genuinely help them and add value and flesh out exactly what they're looking for and stuff. We normally do that over two or three Zooms anyway, so that's that's stayed pretty much business as usual. Um, The end part of the process is the bit that's changed because we do insist on meeting face-to-face before working with people, and that's obviously the bit we haven't been able to do. And we've we've had to carry that on to Zoom, really. Um, so to be honest, it's not the sales process itself. Once the sale and the leads in hasn't been that different, except for not getting a chance to meet face to face. I guess we lose a little bit of the opportunity to build up some trust and relationships and stuff that we face to face brings. Um, but we seem to have adequately bridged it with Zoom. It's just trying to bring the same energy you would face to face to those meetings, which can be tricky sometimes. So I guess for people listening to this who don't uh, know what our sales process is, or maybe how we've been using video for a while, or video calling as well as standard video, is there any elements of that lead up to that first meeting that you found? has served you well having been in this like you're saying not much has changed um it's probably quite a different experience for somebody who's not in our world or hasn't got access to these tools so what are they what are the um the big hitters in terms of video pre that first meeting that you think can actually help you smooth that um smooth that gap yeah like you say in, in the prospecting phase we use video quite a bit anyway so most of Outreach is probably too strong of a word for us because we're not that outbound. But when a lead does come in, the first thing they get from us is normally video anyway to connect more asynchronous video to introduce us as a team or as a company. So that'll be mainly from Caroline introducing herself, um, how we can add value, setting up that first call. Um, the first call is, is done on Zoom and then after that call, we send out another video on Vidyard, obviously thanking them for the time, showing some excitement about um, the process we're about to go through together, recapping the notes um, and stuff like that. So we, we have a pretty much a, a sequence which goes live video on um, Zoom and then follow up video on Vidyard. And we pretty much do that at every stage of the process. And that's served us very well over the years it's allowed us to showcase our team um, introduce some of our personalities uh, without getting face to face so like you said I guess the world isn't all that different for us but for other companies who aren't doing that yet um, certainly the move to having that dual combo of collaborative video and uh, video which you send to them to watch in their own time um, is certainly the combination I'd be advising to people Okay, um, and probably again seems a very obvious to us, but getting started with that sort of stuff is best just using laptop cameras. Yeah, probably the best place to start, isn't it? Rather than staring down at your phone. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, quite like the salesperson in the car sort of <laughs> selfie video. They're always quite good. Yeah, I love the comments when you see them on LinkedIn of people like 
slating them for being <laughs> par. Um, but yeah, the, the way we got started, like you say, it's just laptop video on, you can use Loom or Vidyard or whatever takes takes your fancy, but uh, just using the um, laptop camera and a mixture of just doing direct camera shots and also some overlays. So showing the screen and talking them through something with your camera small at the bottom. Um, a good mixture of those works well. Um, I guess we've been doing it for quite a lot of years and we're fortunate to have a video department and stuff. So we're, at the moment we're slicing up pre-shot footage with live footage. So Caroline will take, will use the iPhone or whatever it is, take the video and then slice that into a playlist which introduces other people and things like that. But you mentioned, uh, I was going to just sorry, you mentioned playlists there, which is one of the features of Vidyard, isn't it? Where you can queue up video. So you queue up two pre records and then your middle one would be a brand new one for personalized to the, to the prospect. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, one of ours is introducing the team. So Caroline will say something like super excited to work with you. We've got the team that we think can help you with your problem. And that's a, a video which is recorded for that specific person. The second video in the playlist is the the overview of the team, which has all been pre-shot, uh, pre-edited. And then the third one's a close by Caroline saying, I uh, hope you can see where we can add value and let's set up a next date. But it's just a, a two specific videos sandwiched with that, um, sandwich in that pre-shot one. But by the time you get into that, you're talking marginal gains. And I'm sure 80, 90% of the value is from just doing the video <laughs> and you can yeah. achieve most of the results from just doing a recording of your webcam um, and having a chat to them just to show your personality and enthusiasm. Yeah. I think just going for that, just doing a video is miles better than no video. I think, like you say, a polished one is probably going to gain you a little bit more kudos or authority but only if you're trying to sell video we offer video so you'd want to in that process you'd need it to look good wouldn't you but you know we did a video workshop uh probably a month before lockdown so about three months ago at least um and one of the guys had loads of camera equipment he was there just to get over that last hurdle or just a fear of being on camera but he posted recently on linkedin and sent it us and he was brilliant. Like he should have just started six months ago. I know it's not as easy as that, but um, you know, like he's into it now. He's like, what was I waiting for? And it was just plain background, simple, and it looked yeah. ma more than good enough. I, I like those. Um, like when you see those polished ones, and like they're they're great. I think in the sales process, I've always thought for like meet the team and about the company, they they work really well. Um, from a salesperson, I think mm. equally like the. That is a big drink, Ricky. Jesus. Nice. Sorry, that's just distracting yeah, me. It's like huge, I thought it was glass. It's like <laughs> it a huge a... vase. Like, what's your drink? It is a three-litre bottle of water, so. Jeez. You only drink in threes. You've got a three-pint <laughs> glass, a three-litre bottle of water. I think you found that I don't like walking up and down stairs. <laughs> <laughs> I bring my day's worth of drink up with me. That's amazing. Um, but what I, was, what I was saying before that uh, was that... Um, the sort of non-polished sales ones give that human element and mm. show that, yes, I have decided to record this today because there's something I want to talk to you about. And it, a, a nice mixture of the two is, uh, is always good. Um, Paul, from your side, I guess we, we could spend the whole episode probably talking about sales process and video. It's, it's, it's its own topic really, isn't it? Um, in terms of like using video which is obviously seems to be the dominant thing we're talking about today for um just communicating with customers prospects um i know you work quite closely in the video platform or at least clients that want to get these sorts of projects off the ground from both the sales and marketing perspective what sorts of approaches we kind of touched on it a little bit there but what sorts of approaches have our clients used that have been successful in it and what what sort of qualities or approaches or like motivations have they had to, to really make this work in their company and, and keep it running rather than just recording a few videos and then knocking it on the head? What's been the best sort of outlook you've seen? I think um, the habit, getting a habit, using it internally as well as for prospects is a good sign that you've got it working nicely because um, 
being able to just leave a message for somebody at the minute. There's there's a big drop off, obviously, from face to face chatting to prospects, meeting clients, meeting your colleagues because you can't. But at least if as many messages as possible are just done quickly over a screen recording, whether it's uh, feedback to each other on piece of work, that's we're doing doing a lot of that with clients, um, recording updates or messages or a prelude to a meeting of what you're going to go through. I've seen that work well. Um, and also summaries of, of takeaways for people who weren't at a meeting. Um, so perhaps say your prospect's boss or something like that. And yeah, I'll put that in a document form. We've just literally, Ricky and I have just come off a call with somebody who was going to take, who wanted to um, take some feedback back to their team. Um, so recorded what what we were running through. And that's that video recording is, it had all ums and ahs. It had somebody dipping in and out of the meeting. But you can obviously just, you can hone in on a, a particular little bit and it's first hand and it is just like, we've actually been on a video call with that person who they show it to because you can you can have the meeting again, which you can't do really in face to face. You can't do the same, can you? So it's like a, a chance to rerun the meeting. So that's that's a good use, recording it and also before meetings um, as like an update to people. And that works well. Yeah. So we we talked now around current prospects um, or sort of sales ready people that are in that process, internal, maybe customer comms, things like that, you know, recording meetings and reporting and they, they all make sense. If we're trying to go out to our audience right now and we can't run an event, we can't do maybe some of the face-to-face -face bits that we might have relied on in the past, what would what have we found to work well what are we looking into and what what are we excited about at the moment that people could maybe use as a stop gap which might not be it might be more than a stop gap if things carry on the way they are but um i think the, the first one is webinars which we talked about i think i i was saying i didn't want to just suggest webinars on this podcast you can't um, not though can you no you can't you can't they, they, they are everywhere um but for a reason, and maybe not as everywhere as we think. We're, we're, we're in digital marketing, so we we do see it a lot. Um, my sort of angle on that was, I think, you know, webinars at the end of the day, it's like having an audience listen to what you're trying to say. Um, you've got a sort of an, an audience that are ready to learn and you can show value very quickly about a specific thing. Um, and, and it looks quite good that you're running webinars and stuff like that. So. For me, like if you're worried about, hey, I haven't got the software to do a webinar, I couldn't get anybody on it, like, or whatever you're, whatever's stopping you doing it. I think using a tool like Loom or Vidyard just to record what you're trying to say, um, whether it's with a colleague or um, you can get hold of somebody in your industry to talk on a quick Zoom. You don't have to have that form filled landing page for your first one. If you want to start pushing it out and getting a feel for what sorts of topics work well, push it out to LinkedIn, 30 second, two minute video, talking around a subject. Um, it's a great way to test the sort of interest of a certain topic so you can get a discussion going through something that's totally ungated. <laughs> and then, you know, a two minute video could maybe turn into a half hour webinar if, if enough people start saying, oh, this would be great if we could have a deeper dive on this. Um, and don't be afraid to be nerdy and niche about what you do i think seeing that stuff on video on linkedin is really refreshing to people rather than having to read huge blogs or whatever um i think that's similar to when ricky was chatting at the beginning about uh prospects and meeting them i think the seeing some or what we've done and are trying to make work is like converting things into a bit of a tripwire because if it's if it's a big it's a big investment to come and work on a b2b relationship usually there's not very many small b2b deals are there but to do that with out meeting some without meeting somebody face to face it could be easier to get to know them via webinars via a training session or an audit or something yeah. there's your company it could be a way of taking baby steps towards your full normal service 
We'd definitely like over video. Yeah, I think it's great for for actually getting reach and getting engagement and getting in front of people right now who may not know you. If you have got a big audience already on social, there's there's plenty you can do. You know, you could do Instagram Live if you're in e-commerce or any anything where that that would make sense. If your audience is on Instagram. Or, you know, there's a lot of live platforms now and I think that's the next, maybe that's the next phase of webinars or whatever once we get past, you know, signing up and waiting. I think people will just be going live at the same time every week talking about something. Um, also, try and make something a bit, maybe something serialized, whether it's live. I think we've just did the series of webinars, Ricky, which might be worth talking about and that was a, that wasn't just a one-off or a full day. It was like a, a set set series, wasn't it? Yeah, I think what what people are doing, I think where people maybe get stuck is what am I going to talk about? And it's probably just having to think about if this wasn't happening, what would you be doing? What would you be talking about? You'd probably be going to trade shows and telling people about whatever you've got coming up or you'd be um, advising, you'd be going around customers and like Paul said, auditing their facilities and giving recommendations or whatever it is it's just I, i'd say just have a look at what you'd normally be doing now and look at how you best leverage that on video because that's the next best opportunity you've got like where we work it's got the beer hall underneath it every friday they do a comedy night every other week they have a dj in there whatever that still happens now it's just on instagram and it's just a way of carrying on the norm the best way that they can and like Paul says, if someone needs to, or like I had to get someone to quote a door on my house or something the other day, and he just made me walk around with my phone and show him it and gave me a quote. Like he couldn't come here, but he could get me booked in for like a couple of months' time and give me the quote now. So just having a look at what you'd normally be doing. And for us, we normally be hosting events and trying to educate people on what the best things in marketing and inbound and HubSpot are to do right now. Um, and we just did that in a webinar series. Obviously, the subject was how to deal with COVID and stuff because that's what everyone's asking right now. But we'd have been doing something like that anyway um, at HubSpot User Group or something that we just haven't physically been able to do. Um, and it worked, it worked well for us. Like To be fair, when I was looking at the stats, the attendance rate, engagement rate, getting a bit marketing but the turn into mqls and sqls and stuff is actually better than a, a real event so the webinars did well for us we've had three good serious sales conversations out of it and we're looking to maybe close a couple of people out of it and from a cost perspective i think if i'm not mistaken zoom webinar was 30 quid for 30 days or something um if you're not advanced enough yet to be using something like HubSpot, it comes with its own landing page, which automatically sends people an email, say, thanks for registering, and here's a link to your calendar. Actually, probably, if it's your first ever webinar, that's all you need. Hosts 100 people, and if you get more than 100, it goes up by 20 quid or something, up to 500. Like, you're talking pretty much no money and pretty much no technical know-how to run a webinar. Um, how much is it? How much would it cost to put that event on in person? Yeah, exactly. So I was I literally had this conversation with Emily because we'd normally be hosting the HubSpot user group, and I think all in that's about five, six hundred quid. Venue, bacon butties, cups of coffee, whatever it is, uh, some biscuits or whatever. I'm sure it's five, six hundred pound. Um, and we literally, I think, from a results perspective, got better than that for thirty quid. Um, I'm not saying that I'd be replacing in-person events with webinars forever, um, but certainly a good part of the mix in the future. But in the current climate, it's like it's your only option to get across your personality, to genuinely add people value, to show that you're enthusiastic mm. about that niche. Like, yeah, I like I like it as a format. I think I think you're right there. Like. We've done the series of webinars and we're, we're hopefully going to do more. But like you say, that's not going to, if everyone does webinars all the time, they'll, they'll slowly d diminish. Um, but for me, like if you're in sales at the moment and you might have a, a an angle or a, a sort of message that you do go through LinkedIn and reach out to people on like a one-to-one -one basis and that 
can be pretty demoralizing or it might work, you know, whatever that is. Um, I think about that message, think about what you're actually pitching to people, how you're trying to connect with them and think, could I translate that to a broader post on my outward post on my LinkedIn and to try and generate a bit of interest with some hashtags responding to, to other things going on in my feed, not just going for, scrolling through sales navigator or whatever to, to pitch. You may even have a video that you send to people, but maybe think about redoing that and having that as something you can send out to your whole audience, um, which might be a little bit less direct, but more trying to generate conversation or facilitate a bit of learning or something, and then try and build that audience now so that when there is an opportunity for face-to-face -face or the time does come where webinars get boring or whatever, you've got a little bit of a pool of opportunity to, to reach out with some more, you know, something a bit more substantial. Um, so I don't see enough people doing that. You see a few and the ones that I see, it, I, I watch them now. I see it, there's a few people in mind, whether they're like a recruiter or a, a traditional salesperson in an unrelated industry, but they're putting, you know, videos like this up some daily, some every other day, just chatting about what they're, focusing on or like a message they wanted to share with their audience and it really works i think it's it's what people come looking for in the end and you start to build a bit of a following so um you forget it's definitely good you forget what you know uh, like i think when you look at people who are really successful on those platforms and stuff all they're doing is relaying probably internal conversations that they've had or conversations that they've had with prospects or whatever it is and just framing it in a generic manner um we all think like oh, if i went on linkedin and just talked about like where's my best place to put my cta everyone's gonna know that but do you know what 99.99 percent .99 of the world doesn't got a clue it's you know it and everyone in your bubble knows it but no one else does and the ones that are putting stuff out there they just when i i did it 30 days in a row and all i all i did was write down questions people asked me when i was talking to them in either internal meetings or uh pictures or the sales process and just answering those questions um and it, it works really well it it shows again what do people look for is they're looking for a bit of thought leadership they're looking that you know what you're talking about they've got a personality that will match them you've got a bit of enthusiasm about you that's all the boxes you tick in it's not you don't have to come up with slide decks or look amazing or whatever it is it's just having a chat about something you know really well which everyone on linkedin knows something really well better than 99 percent of other people um, well, better, so, better than all your prospects otherwise they won't be talking to you exactly yeah it's just having that confidence to think yeah i do know that really niche thing well and if i talk about it there's there's a group of people who want to hear about it and I'm going to put it out there. And if that group want to hear about it, they'll listen. If they don't want to hear about it, they won't follow me. Like it's just the about methodology, isn't it? And I'd argue as well, like even if some of your audience do already know that thing well enough or like you're sort of saying what they already know, I think that's still a positive touch point for someone mm. to scroll through and say, oh yeah, they're talking about that SEO ranking factor that I knew about, but oh, it's cool that they know about it. So I can trust them that we're on at least the same level you know, or I think that's that's to be valued. You don't need to be thinking of that really one thing you're the only expert in. You know, there's there's quite a lot of stuff where I, I share stuff on LinkedIn that isn't, it, it's interesting to me or it's been something that I've remembered from a while ago and I've seen something that, uh, that's reminded me of, you know, an element of it. I think the other week it was around the amount of search that Google um, owns and we all know it's, or pretty much all of it i wasn't showing any new data i'd not found the data myself i'd found the, the visual and um shared that but it's just reaffirming that you're in that industry that you're active in it and that you're thinking along the same lines as your audience and your prospects i think that's really the the way to to unlock a lot of the topics that you might be worried about um how, how do i post something daily or weekly even um well, best case scenario on something like that as well is it just starts a conversation with someone else that knows something about it and it drives a bit of engagement, some comments, some um, pros and cons or whatever it is on the argument that you're putting forward. But the one thing I've never seen on LinkedIn or any social platform is someone put out, it doesn't even matter if it's a video or a blog or whatever, and I've never seen the next comment be, I already knew that. Like, it's not how social media works, is it? You don't... Um, 
no one's looking through it saying oh, i already knew that so that's completely worthless to me it's reaffirming something or it's new information like that's no, not definitely good. definitely um okay so we've kind of covered a bit of both there we've done a bit of sales it's all sort of so around video and social um when we do get, I mean, just more conversational, but when we do get back to normal, do you think, do you think we'll be doing as much face to face? Do you think people will want that or need it? You know, like we, we know how, you know, meetings down in London or whatever for face to face, like closed deals. And I think, you know, do, do you think that'll start to not be as important or people would maybe say, we'd love to do it, but we're really busy. Let's just do it on Zoom, you know, as a, that will be the, the fallback now rather than the cancellation or the move the date. What do you, th how do you see that going? You'd, you'd assume so, wouldn't you? Like I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting not to go back to, to face to face, but I think there'll be a medium, like a middle ground between the two where some people have got confident and comfortable with running meetings on zoom and they're just happy continuing some formats that way. And, um, I think for our sales process, I think I think I'd like to get back to face to face at some point where we're looking to work with people the next three to ten years. Like I want to I want to meet them before I jump into that. But yeah. if you're selling something transactional or project or something, yeah, probably you could you could do away with that. I think the interesting bit, like you say, is more the regular meetings, the scheduled travel. I think a good chunk of that might reduce a little bit do you think, I, I, paul? oh sorry yeah go for oh. it paul oh sorry paul i said what do you think paul <laughs> how, how, uh, how much of your video meetings do you think will be translated into um back to real life stuff do you think it'll all just default back to getting in a room face to face i think if there's ever any you know there's potential hiccup of i'll tell you what though them two can't be here for it so why don't we do this one on video so they can dial in and then let's get a face-to-face -face booked in. Whereas before this, it was, just, no, let's wait till we can get a face-to-face -face booked in. I do think it'll help speed up those other conversations. I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see the transactional presentation not be the bit that's needed the face-to-face. -face. So like you could book in, book in a face-to-face, -face, but maybe it is meeting the team or using it more creatively for a workshop or getting something done rather than we're coming down with our presentation and our prices and you sort of sign and then we they, then we leave it's like that's it is traditionally how it is isn't it come in front and line up in front of the, the decision makers and whereas we could maybe do that over video and then all come down and have a more productive session um, I'd, I'd love it if it sort of use, have the same amount of face to face but maybe use for more productive things yeah, that makes sense. Cool. I think we're um we're about on time for people. Uh, it's about half an hour, so should we call it a day? Awesome. Yeah. Good, Good. to chat, guys. Um, let's try and keep it up before we get back into face to face, eh? Yeah. <laughs> the Zoom podcasts. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Yeah. Good. Thanks for that. Speak yeah. To you. Speak to you all soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.